You're listening to All Marine Radio, broadcasting from Costa Mesa, California, on the All Warrior Radio Network. We continue on a Tuesday. 834, All Marine Radio. Thanks for listening. And uh, joining me from uh, the vicinity of Boise, Idaho, is uh, Ken Rogers. Ken, first of all, uh, good morning. How are you? Fine, sir. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm all right. I'm all right. The, uh, Ken, first of all, tell us, uh, we have to learn a little bit about you, but uh, you're up uh, in the vicinity of Boise. You born and raised there? No, I was born and raised in southern Arizona, between Tucson and Phoenix, and lived there for all my childhood until I joined the Corps. Really? And so what got yeah. you up, what got you up to Boise? I mean, there's a woman in this someplace. Yeah, that was my <laughs> wife. But uh, I lived in Arizona until the early 80s, and then I moved to New Mexico, uh, southern New Mexico, in the mountains, and I uh, met my wife there, and we got married, and we lived there six years, and then we moved to Northern California and lived there 15 years, and uh, decided we wanted to explore the Northwest, and Boise is a pretty good hub for doing that. So. Wow. How, how about that? We're in Northern California. I'm I'm from Sacramento originally. I imagine. Uh, Sonoma County. Son- oh, up uh, up there. So you seem like yeah, a, I don't want to say a wilderness guy, but you like the mountains, you like the green? Well, I like I like everything if it's the right time of the year. So, uh, you know, when you're raised in the desert, you want to live in the mountains where it's cool <laughs> and the trees. And then you live there for a while. Well, you know, it's cold in the winter and you deal with the snow. So, you know, we moved to Sonoma County and I, we liked it there a lot. I didn't like all the rain in the winter. Because uh, I'm a desert person, uh, I guess. So anyway, we've I've lived in lots of places. That, uh, you know, it's like generally speaking, I found out a place is good or bad based on my attitude. So, oh, you know what? I agree with you. I mean, the Marine Corps, you know, has moved me around the the country a little bit, and uh, and uh, I we used to tell our kids, uh, hey. Um, Look, there's good places and fun things to do everywhere you go, and uh, and there's great people all over this country. So uh, just keep an open mind, and you'll be surprised how much fun you have. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of my attitude and my wife's too. And so we, you know, you just kind of you know places have reputations, but there's individual people living there, and most people are pretty good folks. So that's kind of how I look at it. All right, the um, um, Ken Rogers. Now, you go to high school where? In Arizona? I went to high school in Casa Grande, Union High School in Casa Grande, which we call Casa Grande. So. I've been there. My dad, oh, be- yeah, believe it or not, my dad was in Major League Baseball, and the San Francisco Giants used to hold spring training in Casa Grande. And, uh, yes, they did. And they, there was a, the pool that, that the hotel they stayed at was shaped like, I think, a baseball bat, if I recall. And, right. Yeah. No, I, so I, I've been to Casa Grande. Not a whole lot there, but, uh, it was a good time. It was a good well, time. There's a lot more there now than, there's a lot more there now than there used to be. Uh, it, you know, I, I can remember when they built that, uh, and they came to Casa Grande. We used to go out in the summer and watch Willie Mays and, yeah. The Covey and now, the, and yeah, that was back in the day when the Giants had those guys, and uh, they were pretty big time baseball team. That had to be that had to be a uh, a great memory looking back on uh, going back out and watching the Giants come to town. Oh yeah, yeah. It was uh, you know that was the big deal. We'd ride our bikes out of town there. It was like about five or six miles out, so we'd ride our bikes out there and watch the games and <laughs> come back and. How funny. How funny. So how does how does the Marine Corps get on your radar, Ken? Well, I got lots of Marines in my family. I had uh, two uncles 
and three cousins that were in the Marine Corps. I had a cousin who was killed at Chosen Reservoir. Wow. Uh, so it was just around the house. My dad didn't like Marines very much. He was, well, he did not like me. He was an Army guy, so, <laughs> you know, there's that so inter-service you... rivalry. Right. Uh, so I just, you know, it was like the Marine Corps. That was something that was around the house. So. All right. And then, uh, so you graduated from high school when? I graduated from high school in 1965, and I went to Arizona State for a year and didn't. Uh, you know, I just wanted to raise hell and drink. And uh, Good reason to go to college. So, yeah, and so then I was working uh, on a core drilling rig on the Papago Indian Reservation, which they now call the Odom Tohono Reservation, south of Casa Grande, uh, at a potential copper mine down there, and I didn't like that either. And I figured I was going to get drafted if I – because they had the draft, of course, back then, and it was before the lottery, so, yeah, you know, the, your local draft board might pick you, especially if you were aimless and messing around. So uh, I had a friend that lived across the street had lost his driver's license, and he got his draft notice, and he told me, I would like you to take me to Phoenix. I want to see if I can join something. And so I took him up there, and we went to the Coast Guard, and we went to the Navy, and we went to the Army, and we finally, uh, when we went to the Navy, he went in the Navy recruiter's office and talked to him, and the Marine Corps was across the aisle, and I walked in there, and I don't know why I had no intention, but I joined up. So. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what happened? You walked in, and the guy says, hey, how you go? How you doing? And <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I asked him, what, what's going on? And he told me what was going on. Of course... He told me if you sign up for four years, we guarantee you the air wing. And so I took that. And, of course, I never even got close to the air wing. <laughs> and uh, I ended up as a grunt, which, you know, that's what they wanted anyway, mostly. was <laughs> grunt. So uh, I joined up in August 4th, 1966. And I had to wait two months before I could get into boot camp. Uh, they swore me in. And... Uh, so with nine other guys and four of those were draftees and they four of those draft or nine draftees and me and the nine draftees four of them got chosen to be in the Marines which was quite a shock to them. Uh, but then I waited two months before I went in. So I went in on October the fourth, nineteen sixty-six. And reported to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego. Yes, sir. I went on a bus with three other guys from Phoenix, and uh, we showed up, and we were waiting at the bus station, and this, I'll never forget, this corporal comes in the back door, and he says, are you guys going to join the Marine Corps? We said, yeah. And he said, come on outside. And as soon as we got outside, <laughs> well, there was nobody around, man. It was like, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Ken Rogers, our guest, he's now a filmmaker and uh an award winning filmmaker at that and uh <clears throat> we're going to we're going to talk to that after we learn about him a little bit but uh it's it's entitled Bravo Common Men Uncommon Valor and it's about uh, his experience at Quezon and uh the article that first uh, steered me to Ken is uh he's kind of got this badass look on his face with in, standing in front of a bunch of sandbags uh in front of a bunker with a Looks like a shelter half over the hatch, and then a uh, a poncho over the top of it. So uh, that is that picture. That obviously, is that case on? Yeah, that was I think probably taken right before the siege started, probably in mid January, nineteen sixty-eight. And the fact I say that is because we were out. I was outside. And I didn't have a helmet on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there had to be. Uh, that's funny. Uh, let's talk about your. Uh, I've got an email for you, Mac. Um, listening to Ken, I'm, I'm curious. As he talked about the local draft board before we had the ping pong ball system, uh, would he be so kind as ex- to explain both uh, in terms of the draft? Because many of us have no recollection of it. So. For those of, for those people who've never been, you know, really cognizant, you know, and uh, about the draft, explain how the draft worked, Ken. 
Well, you know, I don't know a whole lot about it other than it was, you know, you went, when you turned 18, you had to register for the draft, and I think you're supposed to do that still, but, you right. know. Right. Uh, and then if you were in college, uh, you could get a college deferment. Right. But you had to keep your grades up. If you were in a sensitive industry, uh, you could get deferred. If you were an ag, you know, if your parents were farmers and stuff, it was possible you could get an ag deferment. Uh, if you had a bunch of siblings in the military, maybe you could get a deferment. And generally speaking, when I was in, it was just up to your draft board, and I think they got a quota from the national guys. We need so many people, and then they would go through and decide who to pick. And, of course, where I lived, there was uh, quite a racial diversity because it was a farming area, right. and uh, and there were a number of Native American reservations around. And they, they took a lot of Native Americans and Hispanics and African Americans, uh, but they also took, you know, white guys, too. Uh, I always wondered if, you know, if you knew somebody on the draft board, if it didn't help you not get drafted. Uh, but I was, I was pretty aimless and didn't, you know, I, I think I was probably trying to see if I could cut the mustard. That's probably why I went in there and joined up like that. So, Interesting. What now? Now the ping pong ball system. Explain. Explain that. So. You, well, I don't know that much about it because I was already in when that okay. came about, but I. I think that they, you know, they had a quota that they had to meet, and it was based on, you know, you had a lottery number, and based, I think, on your birthday, and if you you were an early pick on that lottery, if your number was one or two or three or four or five or something like that, you were going to get drafted. <laughs> uh, if you were 365, you weren't. So. Uh, okay, and that was the ping pong ball system. Right, right. Okay, all right. What they call the lottery. The lottery. Yeah, yeah, lottery. The um, the one that most a lot of guys, you know, considering what ha- was going on in the country at the time, a uh, lottery that a lot of guys wanted to stay away from. But they, Ken, now the war in Vietnam is going on, Ken, and, and but you thought you were going to have an air contract. Well, that's what they told me, and you know that I signed up, and of course you don't read the fine print. Right. So, <laughs> uh, anyway. I ended up as a grunt and went to ITR and, you know. How did you, how did it, did, do you remember when you found out you were going to be a grunt and, and, uh, you know, with the war in Vietnam, I'm sure at that point you'd seen, you know, the, the combat footage that would, you know, that started to come home about that time. Um, how did, did that change you? Did, did, what were your thoughts? Uh, we found out our MOS is, Right before we got out of boot camp, our drill instructor, one of our drill instructors stood up and read off our uh, MOS numbers. And I didn't ask, but another guy who had been guaranteed something asked why he was an 0311. And, and the guy said, well, you know, that's what we are. We are riflemen, and we need our best men, you know. Is grunts. And of course, by that time, I'm all gung ho, and we've gone through, you know, a, a shorter version of the of, of boot camp. I think it was like eight eight weeks instead of what they do now is twelve, I believe. Yeah, twelve, thirteen. But after eight weeks of being with the same guys and overcoming all the obstacles, you know, that was kind of okay. I'm all right with that. Uh, right. So, so you so, you finished boot camp. Uh, you went in right. October, so t- right towards the end of December, uh, you head up to uh, Camp Pendleton, and you go to uh, ITS as it's known now. And so uh, ITR, man, it was called it was called right? Infantry Training Regiment at Camp San Onofre, uh, which was in San Clemente, mm-hmm. and uh, still there today. It was pardon. It's still yeah, there, it's still, still there, there today. It, yeah, they call it something else now. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and it doesn't have it. It's got one concert there. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, for historical well, for historical purposes. But it used to be all concert huts. Oh, yeah, that's, it was all concert. Everything was concert huts. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, E. 
dock up there was probably a building, but everything else was a coincidence. Right, right. It was four weeks long, and then they sent you to another advanced infantry training. I don't think that's what they called it, but that's the small unit tactics. That was another two weeks, and then you went to staging battalion, which was where you got ready to go to Nam, and they brought guys from all over the Marine Corps and put you together, and you trained as a company, not to be deployed in Vietnam as a company, but that's, I think they packaged everything together so they could get all the paperwork done and uh, insurance and uh, medical, and then you trained, you did escape and evasion, and more small unit tactics, and, uh, and then they ship you up to El Toro, and you get on a plane and go to Okinawa. So. Interesting, because uh, you know we've since learned one of the lessons about Vietnam, uh, in retrospect, is uh, sending people there by themselves and and uh, with people they weren't going to stay with. And then bringing them home the same way was certainly detrimental to their uh, to their mental health and and uh, to unit cohesion and and but that's the way the Marine Corps did it at the time. You went over there and, and you get to Okinawa and then uh, how long are you in Okinawa? What do you do there? And then how do you get to Vietnam? You report to the Third Marine well, Division, I take it, in Okinawa. Well, it was like I think we went to Camp Schwab. Up in the, up in the north. Well, I think it was in the north. I think it was camp. Maybe it wasn't. I don't remember. I mean, we went down there, and, and they'd have three musters a day, and they'd call out your name and your serial number, and you'd go. And, it, and if you didn't, you went back to the barracks and sat around and worried about what was going to happen. And, and you'd go out to the club at night and <sighs> watch <laughs> guys of world enough to get drunk. And, uh and so I'd been there maybe three days, and I left in the middle of the night, and we flew on Continental Airlines to Da Nang. And I actually was with some guys I had trained with in staging and in ITR, uh, and a couple of them went with me. When we got there, we sat around for four or five hours, and a truck showed up, and they called our name, and we got on a six-by, and went out south west of uh, Da Nang and to a place called Hill 55 to the 26th Marine Regiment. And uh, we hung around there for a week and got another medical checkup and some classes on getting along with the locals and what we can expect. And so we got issued M, uh, M-16s. Uh, we got shot him. Uh, so we stood watch at night. Uh, and then we went out toward various units, which were, uh, I went to Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 26 Marines, which was like four or five miles south of Hill 55 at an old burned out, I imagine French ville, we called it, uh, was a, was a big house with some outbuildings and they'd probably grown rice there. Uh, it had been blown up probably uh, maybe as, as far back as when the French were fighting the Vietnamese there. And, and so, was, so, there was nothing there was so, nothing going on there. It was just really hot <laughs> and wet. I love that. So what part of Vietnam, Ken, are you? I, well, it was, that's in, it was an I-Corps, but not very far from what they call two core, which was south of there. Uh, I'd say probably in the south, in south, in the in the old Republic of South Vietnam, probably about a quarter of the way south. Okay, so you're at the southern end. You're at the southern end of Bicor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What they call the Arizona Territory, uh, which at various times in Vietnam War was an nasty place to be. When I was there, it was like we'd go on these long patrols, and you know we'd just sweat. You know, get wet, uh, get leeches, occasionally a booty trap. Uh, they, we were in what they called a no, a free fire zone, but they had taken all the indigenous people there and hauled them off to Da Nang and put them in these camps uh, so they couldn't support the Viet Cong. Uh, so we were there 
snow, I don't know, three weeks maybe, and then the hill fights, which is the, basically the first battle of Quezon, right. started, and we moved north and got to Quezon at the, just as that was ending, uh, which was in late April or early May of 67. And uh, we ran an operation out southeast of Quezon, and then they stuck us up on Hill 881 South. How did you, how, did, you did you guys truck there? Did you guys, uh, could well, you guys? No, they flew us. They flew us. They flew us from, they, they trucked us from Hill 55 to Da Nang, and then they flew us to Fubai, and we were there a couple of days, and then they flew us from Fubai to Quezon. Okay. So, all right. All right. So now. C-130s. C-130s. I want. I, I want to stop. I want to stop right there, and I want to kind of change gears. And for about five minutes, then we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and and, and talk some more. Um, okay. So you, you spend your time in the Marine Corps. Uh, when did you get out of the Marine Corps? Got out of the Marine Corps in uh, on November the third, nineteen sixty nine, which was about eleven months early. Uh, so they were letting grunts out. They just they were letting us all out because I think they decided that the effort in Vietnam was uh, a no go, and they didn't need a bunch of grunts around causing trouble. So. <laughs> all right, so you come you come back to Conus and, and you get discharged, and then what do you do when when you're discharged? What did oh well, I I went uh, I went home to Arizona and, and I went to college and. I got married, and then I went to work, uh, and then I worked, well, four or five years, and then I went back to college and got a degree in accounting. Uh, oh, smart guy. And I, I was in the, I was in the livestock business and agriculture business for quite a while when I was young. I worked for feed yards and big farming operations, and I was a numbers guy, uh, so that's what I did, besides being crazy and raising hell. So Well, we'll talk about that. So so that's what you do professionally. You're an accounting, you're a numbers guy and in and the business is livestock. Uh well that was what I did and then when I when I moved to New Mexico I went there because I had a friend who had a ranch that we wanted to develop the private property, so I became a real estate guy there. And then when I moved to California, I worked in the, uh, basically in the construction industry for, you know, flooring stuff for, for people to mill the wood and build stairs and, and, uh, install flooring. I was a controller, basically, which is a chief internal accountant, so. So how does uh, how do you get into the film business? Well, while I was living in Northern California, I went to the University of uh, San Francisco and got a master's degree in creative writing. I think because I was trying to articulate my experience in Vietnam, and so I got interested in story, basically in narrative. And so when we moved. To Idaho, I started going to the Quezon Veterans Reunions, and we would sit around and tell our war stories. My wife made the comment to me, when you guys get up and leave these tables, those stories go away. And I said, that's true. And she said, we need to preserve these stories. And I said, okay. And so she talked to our skipper, who uh, is still alive, of Bravo Company, and said, I'd like to tell the story of what happened to you guys. Do you mind? And he said, go ahead. Uh, hope it works out for you. And so we were coming home from this reunion, and she said, I think we ought to make a movie. Now, did she, did, she, about make... did, did she have any background in film? or? No, no. She takes pictures. You know, she's a photographer. So, so a little, a little bit though. It's the same. I mean, different, but you're still telling this using, you know, uh, uh, the visual image uh, to tell a story. So, she, so she well, could, she could see the story. You know, I, you know, and I was, you know, I, I was writing 
stories about my experience there, so I mean, there's that too, uh, understanding how the story works. So we, you know, that's how we get in the film business to make this movie uh, about uh, her company at Kesson. And the film is. We didn't know what we were getting into. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's awesome. Um, you know, the things Marines do, both in and out of uniform, uh, to me are, are, are incredible. And, and this is, this is another one of those things. You're not a filmmaker by trade, but you, you live with this powerful story of this experience that you went through, uh, this incredibly binding experience that you had with other Marines of Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 25th Marines. And then, you know, you find yourself as a filmmaker. I, I, I think, I think it's awesome. The, uh, the film is entitled Bravo. Common men, uncommon valor. Can we're going to take a quick break? And if you hold on, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. We'll talk about your time at Quezon. We'll talk about uh, how you developed the idea of uh, of the movie itself and and uh, how you, how you how you put it together. As uh, if that's all right with you. Sure. All right. All right. Ken Rogers, my guest here on a uh, Tuesday edition of All Marine Radio here on the All Warrior Radio Network, and uh, we're going to continue our conversation with him about uh, his movie, about uh, his fellow Marines, Navy corpsmen, and uh, the incredible fight that they uh, were a part of at Khe in the Republic of Vietnam. More of that coming up next right here on All Marine Radio. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to All Marine Radio on the All Warrior Radio Network. Six minutes after nine o'clock here on a Tuesday morning. Mike McNamara with you. All Marine Radio continues doing what we do, which is uh, talking to Marines most of the time, which is a good job if you can find one. So, anyway, uh, joining me this morning, uh, Ken Rogers, my, a Marine from Vietnam, now lives in the Boise area and turns uh, into filmmaker. And he's made a film, along with his wife, uh, entitled Bravo, Common Men, Uncommon Valor, about his company, which is Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 25th Marines. So, uh, Ken, first of all, uh, a privilege uh, for us to have you on this morning. And, again, thanks for taking time out of your morning to do this. I, re- I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, too, in return. And uh, it's always good to be able to talk about that experience. Oh. So I, I, I've got an email for you. And so we'll, we'll uh, let me read this to you. Mac, could Ken talk about the layout of the hill that we see so often in pictures of Quezon? We see the C-130 moving in and out of there. It's, it looks like to be under fire. We see the constant uh, explosions of artillery. And... Uh, and it looks like the top of the hill has been completely uh, is completely devoid of vegetation. Was at the bottom of the hill and adjacent was that all jungle or was it less than jungle? I'm curious, having obviously never been there. So, Ken, can you describe the terrain around Quezon? Okay, Quezon was sitting on a, a plateau along. There was a town called Quezon, a, a, vi- a village called Quezon, but ca- combat base was north of there on a plateau that sat just above the Rao Quan River, which runs into the Quang Tree River. Uh, it was pretty flat there, but it was surrounded by mountains. Uh, and the, the mountains that you see quite often in the pictures are the ones to the north, and they're two, like, you know, pretty prominent peaks. One's 950, which was always occupied by a platoon of Marines, and there was a, some radio relay up there. And the next one to it is 1015, which I don't think anybody ever was on. I mean, where you couldn't resupply really it. There was also Hill 861, which was immediately west of the combat base, which had been the first hill fight. Uh, it was occupied by a company of Marines. The area between there and the combat base had been mostly a a coffee plantation that 
there wasn't much jungle there. Now, the other, as I first described, there was a big river chasm there with the Ralquan River, and then on the other side was jungle all the way up to the top of those peaks. So it was, the, the terrain was rough, triple canopy, uh, lots of water, lots of, uh, very steep hills, lots of, uh, wildlife, uh, I never saw any, but there were tigers there. <laughs> Different kinds of monkeys, elephants. Oh, uh, I could only uh, imagine. I, I, I could, snakes. Ken, I could only imagine Marines in that environment. There must have been uh, some serious comedy at some point in, in, in between all the fighting and everything. But Marines and wild animals are an interesting combination. Um, well, you know, I was on point one time. We were. On my, on my second time out on Hill 881 South, I was running, running point on a patrol, and we were going up a really steep ridge, and there was a, a, a little rivulet that had run, and it was red, everything up there was red, the red mud. Right. And there were these tracks going up this rivulet, and I knew they were deer tracks, but I had never seen a deer track that size. And so we went up to the top of this ridge and we got over there and down in this little meadow was this critter, you know, bigger than elk, uh, that was down there grazing. And so one of the machine gunners set up his machine gun on his, on his tripod and he shot this animal. And we had a guy from Kentucky there in our platoon that was awesome woodsman. Woodall was his name, and Woodall went down there and he, you know, he gutted that thing and quartered it, and we hauled it back to Hill 881, and we ate it, <laughs> and it wasn't worth a damn. <laughs> we, after, we, we didn't let it hang. Well, you need to let it hang. You know? Right. So, right. Anyway, it was fresh meat, and uh, but I didn't like it. It was pretty rank, and and. Uh, that, that's my little animal story, you know. I mean, you kill snakes if you could, and right. uh, the elephant. We the one elephant I saw was, I think, domesticated because they were pulling using it to pull logs. So then the, the locals were, uh, and I'm sure there were all kinds of things around there, but we weren't paying attention to that because we were looking for somebody to shoot, you know. So right. Hey, can can you uh, the difference between well, another email asks this. Hey, Mac, which hill exactly in the complex was was Ken on, and how many different hills was Bravo Company on in the Quezon complex? So wh- which hill were you guys on, Ken, and then how many did you guys own? Well, we, you know, I was there for a long time. Right. Okay. So the first time I was there, we were on Hill 881 South. Okay. Which is not too far from Laos. And then we were on 861 which for is, a while. Which is further to the, to the west. Which is closer to Quezon. Right, okay. It's, it's closer to Quezon. All right. And then, you know, you'd, you'd go to a hill and then you'd go to the, the combat base. Right. And you'd be on the perimeter and you'd run operations. And then you'd go to another hill and replace one of the other companies in the battalion. And they'd go back to the rear so they could get a shower and hot chow. And because on those hills, you no shower and you ate. Sea rations, and we ran patrols every day. All right. And then, so then we can, then in the, when the monsoon was really starting up and being bad, we went back to the combat base and we ran some operations. And then in October of 67, we went back to Hill 881 South. And we were there till the day after Christmas. And we went back to the combat base, and that's where we were when the manure hit the fan. We were in Gray Sector, which was basically the east and the south edge of the combat base. Uh, so that's where I was the last two and a half months was living in a bunker down there. Okay, so the east and the south end of the Quezon combat base. So there's the road. So uh, it looks like off to your right would have been a, the, one of the main roads that came in from the south uh, into... Now, there were, there were, there, there was, you know, there was Highway 9 went right. from way or wherever over to Lao Bao, which was the, the border there with Laos. 
and then there was a road that came off of the nine that came to the combat base, and right. then there was another one that went directly south. So we were where the the roads came in. Okay. All right. All right. So that's where you spent. And, and then around to the airstrip. I mean, we also ran all the way up to the airstrip. You spent two and a half months there. Right. That time. I mean, a couple of other times I was there too, but the last last time I was there, we came down the day after Christmas, and then we were still in the gray sector when I left, which was about a day before the siege, quote, officially ended, so, which was in April. All right. All right. My guest this morning, um, he's, a, he's a Marine turned filmmaker. Uh, his name is Ken Rogers, and, and we're talking about his uh, Quezon experience. So uh, the shit hits the fan at Quezon. Uh, did you guys yeah. did you guys know it was coming? Did you have a sense because there had been more contacts made uh, in the outlying area? Did you guys have any idea? Well, yeah, we were on red alert every night, but I didn't believe in it. So, really? Because I'd heard this, I'd heard this the whole time I was a case on. We were on red alert all the time, and we were going to get overrun, and we were going to get hit. So I didn't believe anything. I didn't believe them. I thought it was all BS. So. <laughs> so, so the night before it started, then I was on watch and and uh, Puff, which was a airplane prop job that had these mini guns on it, right. were flying over and you know I could see those tracers. And of course, they were firing so fast, all you could see was that red. And I could hear him moaning, and it was foggy, and I thought, man, something's going to happen, and it did. Five o'clock the next morning. So, Describe what that was like. Well, it was really frightening. What were you doing? Were you, were you, were you up? Oh, sure. I, was, I was asleep. Okay, you were asleep. Uh, I was a fire team leader. There were like five of us in the bunker. And uh, all I remember is, this guy coming in and hitting me and pounding on me, get up, get up, get up, it's incoming. And we went out, and man, it was in it. It was really incoming and uh, disoriented and loud and explosions going on everywhere. And then some one of their rounds hit our ammo dump, was, which was really close to where we were. And the ammo dump went up like with 250 tons of 155 and 105 and 106 rounds and all that stuff was going off and crashing and uh, you know it was for about 30 minutes if they could have gotten in the wire I think they could have probably I know where I was they could have probably gotten through us because we were just really disoriented and then <clears throat> after about 30 minutes everybody got their act together so, hey, and we <clears throat> thought they were coming through the wire but they didn't L- Bob what the hell is it like when an ammo dump goes off of, of that size? I mean, well, it, it just—I mean, it's loud and there's stuff going up and coming down, and you know, it's all of us falling in our trench. We were all got in bunkers basically, uh, and just hope that they didn't hit where you were, uh, and then you know there was. CS gas stored in there, so <laughs> a, a tr- the trench line and bunkers all got full of gas, and we were running around with our gas masks on. We all looked like a bunch of weird beetles. Uh, wow! And so, and, 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 this, and, 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 and so, the distance of the ammunition dump from where you are was how far? Oh, probably a hundred yards. Oh, uh, you got to be kidding me! No. Wow! I don't so that's exactly, but it, it was close. And I mean. And there were guys in our comp- our company that were closer than we were. I mean, it was you know you after it kind of calmed down, a platoon commander sent me down the trench to, to see if we could make contact with the guys down on our left. And I went down there, and there were guys laying all in that trench who'd been hit by one five five rounds that never never exploded. They just took it off and went up straight up in the air and came down, and we're hitting them. Uh, you know, shattering their thighs and the trench was full of crap and shrapnel and, you know, it was, it was crazy, man. <laughs> so. 
Wow. You know, and, you, and then you, and then on top of that, you get, you know, the CS gas that's stored in the ammunition dump. And that stuff is designed to cling to low areas, if you've ever been around it. Uh, that comes right. in the trench line just to put a cherry on top. Right, right. And that's, well, you know, and, and that's just the start of the, that's just the start of the day, right? That was a, that was the first four hours, you know, and, and so then, so then, you know, we just thought, you know, okay, so we finally got hit, and we've been expecting it, and we had no idea what was going to coming. So it got worse. So uh, for us, it got worse. Wow. All right. my, again, my guest Ken Rogers, we're talking about uh, about Kason, uh here on a Tuesday edition of All Marine Radio. So that's that's the morning of day one, five o'clock in the morning. The ammunition get dump gets hit. So take us, you know, take us through the days. If you would, Ken, what were they like? I, I mean, you know, we in in the Marine Corps, and I'm an infantryman as well. You know, you know, we study that, and you know, we talk about, you know, interlocking fields of fire, you know, mortars and artillery and dead space, and uh, range cards and all the rest of this stuff. You guys lived in a prepared bunker defense, and how many days does this go on for? Well, it went on for basically. 77 days, that part of the battle for Quezon, what they call the siege. <clears throat> and, it, and after that first day, you know, we got took incoming, but it wasn't really that serious. I mean, we were taking incoming, and okay, we're going to are taking incoming, and we were still running patrols and going out on LPs and setting up ambushes at night and and did so for several weeks. And then when the tech business happened, uh, you know, scared the dickens out of all of us. And from there through the end of, you know, the month of February was like, you know, the we started taking incoming maybe fourteen, fifteen hundred rounds uh, a, a day. Uh, <laughs> and you, but you just said it wasn't that much. You mean compared to the ammo dump blowing up and the and the, and the shellacking you got on the morning of the first morning? Well, that the, no, that that was the that was like for two weeks it wasn't too much, and then it started picking up. Okay. And then right. we, then we started taking like fourteen, thirteen, twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred rounds a day wow. because they had set up. You know, this is in a half mile square area, and they'd like to hit down at Orion because the regimental CP, the battalion CP. The ammo dumps, uh, that kind of stuff were all right around where we were. So, I mean, they were pounding the hell out of us. And they set up some 152s, which was basically, I think, about an 8-inch gun. Right. Right inside Laos, in, inside these caves in a plateau. And they'd roll these guns out on these, I think, on railroad tracks, and they'd let us have it, and then they'd put them back in, and you couldn't. This plateau was so constructed as you couldn't get at them with air power, and they were too far away for our our guns to fire back. And uh, that was the that was the worst. Those things sounded like freight trains coming, and so I mean that went on for. Uh, you know, February, that was, that got to be a daily thing, pretty much. Uh, and then we sent out a patrol on the, uh, 25th of February off to the south east. And they went out there and they got ambushed and there were 26 guys killed and, or 27 guys killed and one captured. And we weren't allowed to go out and get them. And the guy, the survivors, struggled back in over a five or six or seven hour period. And after that, the Vietnamese dug a trench line all the way around basically Quezon. And we were looking at them and they were looking at us. And we were sniping and they were sniping and they were shooting their 57 recoilless rifle metal, you know, the Coilus rifles, and we were shooting at them with 106s, and mortar fire was coming in all the time, and it was like you lived below ground. Uh, and, you know, like all day.
day and all night. We had air power coming in there and pounding the dickens out of them. B-52 raids were close. I mean, really close. Uh, 175 is firing from the coast. Uh, uh, it was insane, and you couldn't go outside the wire. And, and, and you know, the guys out on the hills, and we had occupied hills around. They were also getting hit, and, uh, and we thought it was the end of the world. How did you? How 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 would somebody get medevaced if you were hit um, from one of the outlying hills? They'd go in and get them. You know, with eighty one. With help. About what happened? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would, would they go in with helicopters, or would you? Would yeah. you? Yeah. Wow. They have these strategies of going in with helicopters, and they go in with a whole bunch, you know, a gaggle or or something. I can't remember anyway, and it just you know made it more confusing for the North Vietnamese because on those hills, you know, they were isolated. I mean, they were completely surrounded by the enemy. Right. And on Hill 881, they lost a lot of choppers, uh, I think. A lot of people got killed getting on and off. Uh, so it was like crazy, and then, you know, they, when they'd come in at Quezon, as soon as they'd come in and start to land, the incoming would start coming in. The, the, the planes, for a while, stopped coming in, and they'd, you know, parachute stuff to us. Uh, and if they did come in, they didn't stop. They'd land. They'd go down to the end of the airport, turn around. They'd have that tailgate open, and skids would come off on a parachute. And if you were on there, they'd just throw you off and tell you to run for the slit trenches. Uh, it, was, it was, you know, there were, there was one C-130 and a 123 and some, a number of choppers got shot down there at the combat base. It was nuts. You know, Ken, it sounds, it, it sounds nuts. I mean, it sounds like something like, uh, you know, World War One. Except with modern aircraft and things like that, it's hard for us to even. And you know, you said danger close with B fifty twos dropping. Uh, it's you know, it sounds like to include even twenty seven guys killed on. And you know, they went out to do run a patrol, or did they? They went out to set in an ambush. What were they doing? No, they went to. They were running a patrol, and we'd been out there running patrols basically for a month after the first day. You know, I mean, basically in. Uh, after the first day, January 21st, we've been running patrols basically out there all the time. So they could, they went out to a checkpoint and they saw two North Vietnamese soldiers standing out farther along. And so they decided to go get them. And they were chasing these guys and they, I wasn't there. I, I mean, I'm just right. what I remember and what people have told me. But then they ran up and they, they, they were waiting for them. I mean, they knew, and it was a trap, I think. A baited ambush. And so they ran up on this trench line that nobody knew was there, uh, that they had dug evidently overnight and popped up and, you know, the slaughter. Wow. 27 Marines killed. That's, I don't care where, I don't care where you ever are. That's a big number. The um my my guest this morning is Ken Rogers. He a a Vietnam Marine uh, turned filmmaker. Uh, the the title of his film is Bravo, Common Men, Uncommon Valor, and it's the story of Bravo Company First Battalion, Twenty Fifth Marines uh, during the Battle of Khe Sanh. The uh, another email for you, Mac. It's hard for me to fathom what that must have been like to live with. How did they sleep? Could he talk about how they rotated and how they stayed alert? So on, on a normal day, uh, can you walk us through how you stayed alert uh, in terms of how, how many guys were, you know, in the trenches? How did you sleep? And uh, how, did you, how did you sustain that for the course of 77 days? You know, I don't really recall that much about that part of it. Uh, you know, you stayed down. I mean, we dug, we did a lot of digging. <laughs> and we never stopped digging. We just kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and uh, you know, re filling sandbags. And you just lived with your head below the, the trench line. I mean, and usually you were fifty per 
percent. You know, two guys up, two guys down. Uh, unless they called a hundred percent, then everybody was up, which was quite often. You didn't sleep very much, and when you did get to sleep, then the incoming might start, and you certainly weren't sleeping then. Right. Uh, so, you know, you're young and you're jarheads, and there's nobody but you and the guys around you. So, I mean, you just got to get through it, man. Can the uh, I want to transition to, uh, to well let's kind of so now the siege goes on uh, is there uh, are are there key moments in the siege that you guys either thought well you know we're going to be able to we're going to we're going to we're not losing this thing are, are there key moments that you remember in the key in, in the siege? Well, it seems like to me if I remember right if I. Somewhere in the middle of March, it became apparent to us that it wasn't as dangerous. I mean, I, you know, it was still all going on, and we were taking a lot of incoming, and and it, but it just didn't feel as dangerous. And I think that's because the North Vietnamese had decided that maybe they were going to, this wasn't working for them. Uh, but I know that on the uh, 23rd of March, we took like 1,400 rounds one night, that night. It was horrible. I mean, it was just crazy. And then on the 30th of March, we went out to get all those guys who were out there, those 26 guys. Right. We, we went out to get them, and we got out there, and we got into a North Vietnamese trench line, and they got involved in a battle that lasted about five hours. And... Uh, we didn't pick up very many of those guys, and we had 12 KIAs, and I think everybody was a WIA that was on that patrol. And what they told us is we wiped out a battalion. Wow. And it was satchel charging bunkers and flamethrowers. We were using flamethrowers on them, and it was bayonets, and it was crazy. I mean, it was just nuts. Uh, and after that, it was like, it seemed like everything kind of relaxed. And I, and I know it didn't for other guys because the fighting there went on, in, you know, until July. But it, it, the nature of the fighting, I think, changed. It went out because we were, you know, the first air cab came up the road and the Marines went out of the combat base and they started assaulting these positions where the North Vietnamese were. But it was like in March it started to light up, light, lighten up a little bit. You know, not, it wasn't as steady a pounding we were taking, although uh, on various days we'd really get the hell knocked out of us. So. It's an amazing story, and it's hard to even, you know, fathom it when you talk about, you know, 152 guns uh, shooting at you from caves in Laos that you couldn't get to and, and the, the sheer amount of ordnance that got expended against you guys. And, uh, and 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 living like that day after day after day, and then in the midst of all that, saying, "Well, there came a point that it it wasn't that bad anymore. <laughs> it wasn't that bad anymore." And, and listening to it, it almost sounds absurd. Except you're absolutely serious when you say that, and you say it as somebody who who lived there and endured it, and you knew that that, that it wasn't as bad as it had been. It's just it's just astounding to to hear. I'm curious. I want to switch gears and talk about filmmaking and post-combat related mental health and, and, and things of that nature. First of all, let's talk about post-combat related mental health. You came back. Um, did that, how much did that experience change you as, as a guy? Well, it changed me a lot. I think, you know, my mother for years went around and just would mumble that damn war. Uh, you know, is it, you know, I went over there, I was a, you know, country naive kid. And, uh, I came back and I was a cynic and about a lot of things and a fatalist about a lot of things and I, uh, I accepted the fact that human beings are capable of normal human beings that you know that are really great people are capable of surgery if necessary, and it changes your outlook on the human race. It does. I mean, you can't you can't avoid it. On top of that, you know, we suffered from all of this business that, of course, it 
wasn't recognized. He didn't have PTSD. He didn't have TBI. Don't talk about that. That's crap. You're, you're just a bunch of wimps. Uh, and we were all dealing with that. So it was crazy. You know, I, I, I was in the Marine Corps for a year, almost a year and a half after I got back from Vietnam. And I can remember I worked at a, at a, you know, you, I was in a Marine barracks, uh, in San Diego. And to get in this barracks, you had to be a Vietnam veteran. And we ran the brig and we did security on the, on 32nd Street Naval Station. Right. There in, outside of, uh, National City. Mm-hmm. And we were nuts. I mean, we were crazy. Everybody in that place that I remember was, from sergeant down was nuts. I mean, it's like, you know, if I had been a, a, those old time sergeant majors and stuff, I'd have wondered what the hell I'd gotten myself into. You know, we were just crazy. Uh, there was, you know, a lot of drinking, there was drugs everywhere, there were, you know, fights, uh, you go out at night to a bar and man, you know, you could count on one of your buddies getting us in a fight. No. And look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. So, not so much me. I usually would sit on a bar stool and watch them. So as uh, as you as you got older, these things that we that we now talk about, um, you know, as if they've always existed, uh, post. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, as as well as traumatic brain injury, um, that much incoming, I mean, I'm sh- I'm curious about your thoughts about that. Do many of the guys in, in your company suffer from TBI? Oh, I think all of us did. I mean, we were getting, you know, we'd get knocked off our feet, slam our heads into the deck. Uh, you know, that stuff that hit close to you and forced blood out of your body, uh, you know, it was, you know, some guys got serious head injuries. So, yeah. And, you know, but you didn't, you, that stuff didn't exist. Right. And so what, so did you, um, did you struggle with it? I mean, in, 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 in terms of uh, your job on a daily basis, your relationships with other people, did did you pretty much do what a lot of guys did, which is simply stuff it in in the trunk and, and try to go about your life? How did you deal with it, Ken? Well, that's you know that's what you did, uh, and then you went to the bar at night, and uh, you know I was my experience with that, and I you know I got I had PTSD. I mean I do, and right. it was like it would be I'd be okay for a while, and then all of a sudden something would trigger it. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's rage and paranoia and all of this stuff that comes with, with it would get really bad. Uh, you know, and I, I was, uh, my first wife, you know, I, I'm sure I scared the hell out of her more than once, uh, physically. Uh, I would just get so angry, stuff would trigger her that I would just go into rage and I had no, Anticipation was coming, no control over what I was when I was doing it. Uh, and it was, you know, and then, and then hanging out with a bunch of other guys that are like that, and none of us would talk to each other about it. I mean, you didn't talk about it. I, mean, I had a friend who I was with in the Marine Corps after I got back from Vietnam who was going to the University of California at Berkeley studying to be a psychologist, and he was telling me about PTSD. Now, this is the early 70s. And he said, you've got PTSD. And I told him, if you don't shut up, I'm going to whip your ass. <laughs> I don't have that. Right. <laughs> right. Wow. So, um, at what point does, um, at what point did you, did you go seek help? Or when did, when did that happen, Ken? When did, Okay, so I, I, you know, I was from 19, the mid 1980s to through the 90s, I was pretty okay, as I remember it. 
And then in, on 9-11, when that happened, that really, and I think this happened to a lot of Vietnam veterans, that really was like, it tore the scab off, and all of those feelings came back. The anger? So I dealt with that. I dealt with that. And, and, and this is the, the funny thing. I had never been to the VA. I would never acknowledged their existence. The only thing I'd ever done was they educated me, and I bought a house. I'd never been to the medical facilities. That was something you didn't do in the late 60s or the early 70s. You didn't go to the VA, okay, because they were, they'd kill you. That right. was what the, the word came down. And in 2008, my wife and I were out with some friends of ours, in a restaurant here in the Boise area, and this guy said something to me, and I just went berserk and was just exploded. And uh, I told myself, and I told my wife, you know, I need to stop doing this because I'm going to hurt somebody, and uh, and maybe myself. And so I went to the VA in 2008, first time I'd ever been there. And I was under treatment for a little over a year for PTSD, and they told me I was cured, and I ain't cured. But, you know, I'm sure they got their problems with manpower and money. So I'm not, you know, I don't do stuff like that, or I haven't. I haven't had an episode like that. So uh, anyway, I have a purple heart, so I get, you know, they take care of me, or they're supposed to anyway. The, talk to me about TBI. Now, you, 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 how many, how often does the First Battalion, Twenty Fifth Marines? How often do you guys get together? Uh, once a year. Once a year. Wow, I've never heard of that. That's crazy. I mean, that's crazy good. You know, now everybody tries to stay connected on Facebook, and um, and. Uh, Wow, I think that's incredible, Ken. So you guys get together once a year, and how long have you you been doing that for? Well, they've been doing it since, like, 1989, I think. I first went in 1993, but the politics, the internal politics of the organization were so nasty that I said I'm not going back. And then I went back, and like about eight years ago, I started going. And and it's what it is is the case on veterans. Okay. Basically, if you were a veteran of case on, but probably eighty percent of the guys are from twenty six nineties. Okay. And uh, all three, of them, you know, particularly the people who were at case on were the the ninth Marines, the third Marines, the first Marines, and the twenty six Marines, and maybe some other units. But those were the ones usually that were there that and that saw all the crap over the course of like a year and a half. So. Most of the guys there are 26 Marines because we lived at Quezon. I mean, I lived there for 11 months. Right. Right. Home. And so they'll have a reunion on the East Coast, and they'll have one on the West Coast, and then one in the middle, and one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and one in the middle. Uh, and there'll be five, six hundred guys show. Wow. Do you mind if I ask you about suicide? Have you guys had much of a problem with suicide post-Vietnam? Yes. And, you know, there's a number of a number of guys that were there at case on who have terminated their lives. So, I, mean, I don't know if it's as bad as it is now, but it's not good. So, and I mean, they're, they're, you know, my wife and I are in the process of making another film about wives of combat veterans. And the first interview we've done is a woman whose husband was at case on, and committed suicide 40 years later. So, I mean, this kind of stuff kind of sticks with you. Kind of. I was just talking to Carl Marlanis yesterday who wrote the book, What It's Like to Go to War, and was, uh, right, right, you're familiar with him. And um, he talked about how necessary it is for families to go to therapy uh, or get counseling on their own uh, when you have somebody uh, who's going through this, and he said, if uh, if they don't, um, he said, can you imagine being a family member and watching this, this angry, 
violent person that you, you know, that you love that didn't used to act like this. And uh, they need to know that we're just being affected by our experience and, and that, you know, it'll pass and, you know, and then maybe how to, how to deal with it a little bit on their end so that they can help. He said, but uh, the family, you know, often gets left out and, and he said it's terrifying for them. And he said, you oh, know, sure. and he, he told a story about coming in with the groceries uh, in his hands and his daughter, one of his young daughters had put the chain across the door. And so he opened the door and pushed on it and expected it to open. When it hit the chain and bounced back, it pissed him off and he dropped the groceries and he punched the door. Right. You know, chain comes off, you know, the, the door frame screwed up, you know, and it's that explosive anger that you can't control. And um, his wife looks around the corner and smiles and says, did everybody take their medication today? And he said, you know, had she, <laughs> we laugh about it, right? Had she, he said, had she not gone to therapy, therapy with me and didn't know what she knew, that would have become a huge incident. As it was, it was just, you know, hey, your dad lost it. It's okay. You know, he doesn't mean it, but he's affected by, you know, what's happened to him in his life. So we're going to make sure he takes his medication and then we're going to have dinner. And he said it was uh, the difference between his family being involved and not involved was it was huge. Talk to me about in the film itself. What are you trying to convey uh, to the viewer that watches your film about First Battalion, Twenty Fifth Marines, and 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 Bravo Company's experience uh, on Case On? Well, you know when I I flew out of Case On and I was on a no, it was CH-46, I think is what it was. And I flew down to Dong Ho, and I got out of the chopper, and I looked back up at the hills, and you could basically see the mountains where we kind of been. And I thought to myself, that that's a hell of a story. And so that story has been brewing down inside me for all those years. And basically, when we started out, we just wanted to tell the story of what happened. We were going to get a narrator, and we were going to Vietnam, and we were going to do all this stuff, and we got 15 guys to sit down and tell us what it was like. And, I mean, they did. I really did. It's, those interviews just blew me away, uh, the honesty and the emotions. And when we got to the end, it was like we had, we didn't need a narrator. We didn't need any experts. We didn't need to go to Vietnam. We just we had the story right there. and. And what I think we're trying to do, and it morphs all the time because the film gets used for all kinds of things that you never anticipated, is we're trying to explain to people this is what it's like when you send people off to do this. And there's so many people in this country now who have no idea what it's like and we'll just say, hey, thanks for your service and we'll go on down and we'll party the weekend and you have no idea what it costs. And, you know, we talk about TBI and we talk about PTSD and we talk about coming home and needing, you know, you need something to do and we talk about fear and all this stuff and it wasn't planned. These guys just talked about it and it's all in there. Uh, and it's just a narrative over, you know, this is what happened. We start at the beginning and we end at the end. And then we have 20 minutes of them telling what it was like. And they talk a lot about what it was like to come home and be treated, you know, at the best like you were, you know, inconsequential. At the worst, you might get a spit on. Somebody say some nasty stuff to you and you get in a fight. Uh, what it was like to have PTSD. Uh, what you you know what it was like to deal with the injuries. Uh, so you know I just wanted to tell the story of you know these amazing these guys were amazing. I mean the people I served with were absolutely amazing because they some of them were shipbirds and some of them were gold bricks. But when the crap hit the fan, man, everybody showed up. You know, and it was just like what the human mind and spirit is capable of when they're put under stress and they need to operate together is amazing. That's all I can say. No. Is, 
I know I, I ask this a lot. Is there any way that you could put into words of the courage and selflessness that you saw at Kaysaw? No. I can't. I mean, it was just... So you just get out of the way and let, let their stories tell themselves? Yeah, and it was, we, we just let everybody tell their story. And, you know, I asked them about, do you remember this? Do you remember, because I did the interviews. Do you right. remember this day? Do you remember this day? And then they they talked and they talked and they talked and they talked. And some of them had never told a story before. Uh, it was pretty amazing. And, you know, I think if they were like me, when they were doing all this stuff, it was amazing. It was just like, this is what the, the day's business is. This is the business we're about. This is what we do. We don't like it. We're scared. I mean, and I was scared the whole damn time I went up through that crap. And I'll tell you, I was really frightened. Uh, that's all I can say. But when I had to go do something, I went and did it. Because those guys, you know, that peer pressure in the Marine Corps, in the combat is tremendous. If you don't do what you're supposed to, how are you going to live that down? Uh, plus, you need that guy over there to take care of you. So you better take care of him. Uh, and so, I, I mean, it was it was what we did. Amazing. We had to do it, we did it. Amazing. Ken, do you have advice for, uh, i got a couple emails for it, but let me ask you one more question. Uh, do you have advice for uh, combat veterans coming home? You're uh, you're about 30-something years ahead of uh, guys who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you have any advice for them? Well, my advice to them is, you know, get over and get you some mental health counseling. I mean, that's really – I, I would have been a lot better off if I had done that. And, you know, there's, it, there's no shame in it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Go get some counseling. And, well, you know, I think Carl Marlantes is right, and take your family with you. Because my my kids, I, you know, my my daughter did had no idea what I went through until she saw the film. <laughs> so, oh, really? Like 40-some-odd years later, because I didn't talk about it. You know, I just reacted to stuff, and they knew all knew that I was, you know, a powder cake that would go off at the strangest of times until they saw that film. They had no idea of what I had gone through. So you need to... What did they say? Mental health. How many kids do you have? Two. How, what did they say when they saw the film? Holy shit. No one... You know, no, what, no, 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 no wonder you're crazy. That. He just shook his head, but my daughter didn't say anything to me. She said to my wife, she said, I had no idea my father went through that. Wow, an amazing story. Emailer writes this, <clears throat> Mac, in terms of TBI, with all that incoming, I'm sure all those guys have suffered some form of TBI. Are they? Do they have a higher rate of Parkinson's or anything noticeable that they notice? Um, because at some point when you scramble your brain, he's, and he says in parentheses, the goddamn ammo dump going off 100 meters from you. Holy shit. End of parentheses. Um, at some point, that has to have an effect on, on your life. So uh, relative to TBI, have you guys noticed a higher incidence of, you know, Parkinson's or anything like that, which would seem to be symptomatic of that kind of concussive effect? Well, I can't answer that question. But from my standpoint, I don't know the answer to that. Uh you know, we have a lot of guys dying, but most of them are dying from cancer, so, uh, which is another issue. So. Agent Orange? Yeah. yeah. Wow. We got sprayed. I watched them spray it. So. I mean, we got sprayed, and it was in the water, and, you know, I mean, it was just there. I mean, it was just part of our experience. Ken Rogers from uh, a Vietnam Marine, uh, fought at Quezon. It's now turned a filmmaker, and the title of the film is Bravo, Common Men, Uncommon Valor. It's the story of Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 25th Marines during the, the siege of Quezon. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Ken. Go ahead. That's okay. No problem. All right. The um, next question. Mac, where the hell do we get the video? I want to watch it. 
So, Ken, how do we how do we get a hold of the video? How do we watch it? Well, it, 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 right now it's only available through DVD and uh, www.bravotheproject.com. Bravotheproject.com. Right. All right, you can go there and you can buy it. How much is it going to cost me? Nineteen ninety-five. Nineteen ninety-five. All right, and you're making a you're making a second one about uh, about the families or wives or, or specific the wives. The wives, uh, which will also, of course, is going to talk about the veterans and the families, and we're going to cover women from World War II through the current combat. So I've got a text message for you, Mac. I'm curious. Has Ken learned things that he didn't know about Quezon because of the project? Ken? Yeah. Oh, yes. I learned stuff that happened that I had forgotten. I learned stuff that I didn't know. Uh, but I have learned a lot of stuff about Quezon from not just from the film, but from the increased interplay I've had with men who served there. So. Yeah, it's been a, you know, I'm still learning. Mac, I thought Ken was recognized by the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation. Um, I haven't heard either you or him mention that. Ken, have you, have you guys been recognized by the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation for the film? Yes, we went to uh, a museum last April, and, and uh, we were given the 2016 Norman... Major Norman Hatch Award for the long documentary. I <laughs> just got to talk to the Commandant, and everybody was dressed in their dress blues, all these generals and colonels. You know, I, I was an E4, man. <laughs> <laughs> how'd, how'd that go for you? <laughs> oh, it went great. Uh, they're just, I was really impressed with the Commandant. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody said that, uh, who is it, Dunford or, or Neller? Miller, I was impressed with him. He's a good man. He's a straight. Yeah. He's a great. He's a straight shooter and a and a good man. Well, I'll tell you, he is. I mean, he just says it the way it is, and, and uh, he's a nice man too. A very nice man. Yep, yep. Yeah. He's he's one of my battalion. He was one of my battalion commanders. And, oh, is that right? Uh, yeah, no, I I know him well. In fact, he was the first guest ever here on All Marine Radio. Uh, I told him we I was going to launch this thing, and he said, uh, "Well, let me know." And I said, "I'd like you to be the first guest," and he said, "I'll do it." So he's uh. And, you know, what What he wants is, what, you know, my vision of what All Marine Radio is, Ken, is someplace that guys like you, me, our friends, uh, current day Marines can go and we can listen to our culture. You know, like young Marines could, you know, benefit, you know, and guys who are out of the service. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, the Marine Corps is a warm place. It's like a warm blanket. And whenever you're around the company of Marines, as you say, you, you were an E4, but you're hanging out with the Commandant. It's, it's a good feeling, though. Because they're Marines, and we speak the same language. We tend to see life a little, mostly the same way. And uh, so hoping that this can be a, a pipeline that guys can tap into all over the world and uh, on a daily basis feel that connection and not feel isolated. And so hopefully, uh, you know, by listening a little bit, they can get smart about mental health and we can maybe impact the amount of suicide and, and, and mental health issues that are going around. But uh, he was completely supportive. And uh, and uh, as you say, he's, he's a great guy. And uh, welcome and c- congratulations on the award. Uh, now I'm, now I now I really need to to, to see the film. I'm I, I'm curious. What about uh, what about you personally? Um, was this you you went into this project, you know, wanting to kind of document the stories as you know you relayed the conversation with your wife initially? Um, how how has this whole project impacted you? Well, I think it's been really good for me uh, because it has gotten me involved in something that I'm passionate about, and I think that's always good. I don't think I've ever been as passionate about anything in my life as I have about this project. So I kind of went in it, you know. I, I, you know, when she said we're going to make a film, and I said okay, I had, I did not believe that was going to happen. I did not believe we would make a film. Uh, cause we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Uh, but we did make it and once we got going it was like, yeah, uh, this is really important for me to 
be able to get this story told. And it was important to me because it's been bugging me for all these years that somebody needed to document this amazing story. Uh, and so that's been extremely satisfactory on a personal level. Plus, I mean, it's forced me to confront all the things that, you know, you have to. This guy got killed, that guy got killed, uh, you know, seeing somebody drive down the road with, you know, the guy his head blown off, you don't see his face, but you know who he is, uh, you know, that kind of stuff that haunts you, it's forced me to confront that, and I think that's been good for me. So. His name is Ken Rogers. He lives in the vicinity of Boise, Idaho, born and raised in Arizona. And uh, a member of the United States Marine Corps since uh, 1966 when he uh, when he went to boot camp. Ken, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, spending time with us this morning and, and telling uh, telling your story. It's uh, Kaysan is one of those battles like the like Chosin, uh, like Iwo Jima that uh, that always gets mentioned on the short list of uh, of heroic Marine efforts. And uh, you and uh, and Bravo Company 125 are certainly in that uh, in that hall of I don't know what hall of heroes, hall of champions. I don't know what we would call it in the Marine Corps, but certainly a place of honor. Uh, the courage that you guys displayed for such a long period of time, uh, the video that that we all see, and uh, and now hearing you talk about uh, about it, what what it was like on a daily basis, uh, certainly a uh, tip of the Marine Corps helmet. Uh, to you this morning and as well as all your mates for what you guys have done. And then as a Vietnam veteran, uh, I want to personally offer the thanks of myself and all my peers because, w- because of what you went through, we don't get treated like that anymore. And, and, uh, and I cannot imagine having your experience and coming home and being treated, uh, with the back of, uh, the nation's hand like many of you guys were. So, uh, thank you for doing this. Um, and uh, God bless you for everything you went through, and 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 you guys kind of paved the way for the way we get treated. And uh, and there's no amount of thank you uh, that I can say that that can ever replace how you were treated. But uh, on behalf of me and all my uh, all, all my peers, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for listening to me talk. <laughs> oh no, let me just tell you, I I could do that. I I have a I have a I have a great job. <laughs> yes, interviewing uh, you know current day Marines and and uh, guys who used to be in the Marine Corps and their incredible stories. I mean, our culture is is absolutely phenomenal, you know. And and yesterday uh, a guy named Matt Morgan was on talking about the uh, he's the guy who produced the piece that's going to be on the Smithsonian Channel about the uh, forgotten. Uh, the unknown flag raiser on Iwo Jima. Uh, now that oh, yeah. he, so, uh, you know, he retired lieutenant colonel. And, uh, you know, and just that whole story is, is riveting. Then Carl Marlanis, a Navy Cross winner, you know, yesterday, got to talk to him yesterday, you know, get to talk to you today. Then tomorrow, the director of the Marine Corps, uh, historical, uh, branch is going to join us and talk about, uh, and talk about the Iwo Jima and, and from an institutional perspective, you know, how they had to look at it, what they had to go through in order to do that. And then uh, I'm going to interview a guy who was at the Chosen uh, tomorrow as well, and then uh, a guy who was on Iwo Jima on Thursday. So uh, I have I have what, <laughs> what I have a great job for a Marine because our culture is incredible. And, and you know, you think you're going to tell one story. I'm sure like you learned. You think you're going to tell one story, and, and then all of a sudden these other stories start popping up that are so compelling that you're telling along the way. It's just, uh, it's just a, a great experience for me and, and, and you're a piece of that. I've never, I've never spoken at length to anybody, uh, who was at, uh, who was at Quezon. So, uh, certainly a privilege for me this morning and, and, uh, and, uh, I loved every second of it. So, uh, you don't mind if I bug you? Maybe we'll do this again sometime on whether it's a separate sure. issue or uh, whether we sure. talk about Quezon again. I'd love, I'd enjoy doing it. Sure. All right. Enjoyed it a lot myself. Thanks a lot. And what you're doing, I think, is, is uh, you know, for Marines is very important because, you know, I mean, I, I, I have mixed emotions about the Marine Corps when I was in it. I didn't like it. Uh, but, you know, once you're in it, you're in it. And 
the older I get, the more I find how much I am in it. And so all of these stories, you know, enrich the fabric that we endure and live with. And so I think it's a great thing what you're doing. I, you know, thanks a lot for letting me talk about my guys. So. No, I'll tell you what, a, a privilege. And, and just so you know, Ken, what we'll do is we'll take this, uh, this audio, we'll throw some pictures of it. Up and then we'll uh, we'll put it on YouTube so anybody who wants to listen to the interview uh, can find it on YouTube and all they have to do is uh, search under uh, All Marine Radio and uh, they'll they'll find our channel and then uh, your uh, your helmetless head on K Sano will be the uh, billboard for the uh, YouTube video and so uh, we'll uh, happily put that up and uh, so anybody who wants to listen to it uh, feel free to shoot the link out and. Uh, and they can hear uh, you uh, wax eloquent about your time on Quezon. Okay, so uh, when when can I expect to do that so I can get it shared? I'll, uh, we'll probably have that up tonight. We'll have to you okay. know, we'll have to produce the the audio and get get a couple pictures, and uh, we'll produce that, and it'll be up tonight. And then I, I will uh, I will more than happily shoot you the link. Okay. All right. Ken, again, thank you, thank you very much for doing this, and uh, and congratulations on all your success. And uh, and what I think is best is uh, you talked about the passion that you had for doing it, but uh, at its core, it's this unselfish desire to make sure that the things that you saw and were a part of are documented because they're so important and they're so moving. And and I think great things come about from unselfish work, and and you and your wife are certainly a great example of that. So congratulations. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate right. it, and, and likewise with you. So. All right. Very good. Thank you, Ken. All right, sir. Bye. All right. That is uh, Ken Rogers. 1,700 rounds a day. <laughs> it's You can't even, like, come on. It's like World War II stuff. I mean, World War One stuff in the trenches in France. Just hammering each other. Crazy. And uh, Quezon. Wow. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, the gunner going to join us on a Tuesday edition of All Marine Radio. More of that coming up next right here on the All Warrior Radio Network. Don't go anywhere. 